This morning, we're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, where Paul begins speaking of the mystery that has been now revealed. But I wanted to start off, it's kind of my, my go-to hymn. I just love this hymn, Blessed Assurance. And some days I need to be assured and reminded that I am His, because uh, some days we don't feel like it. Amen? Uh, that's not my case this morning, but I just love this old hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born in His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. It's good to give praise to God, isn't it? Um, there's a verse that says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I don't know any better way than uh, to get out of a spirit of heaviness than to put on the garment of praise. And um, uh, just for some of you this morning, if you have that spirit of heaviness, I want to encourage you just to take some time to praise the Lord. Maybe not in song, but just go through the list in your mind, in your heart. What are the things you have to be thankful for? What are the things that God has blessed you with? Uh, start with the salvation that you have in Christ Jesus, because none of us sought him on our own. He sought us and he drew us and we came to know him. And start with that, just thanking him for his wonderful salvation and uh, Paul is going to speak to that, uh, of that to these Ephesians, these Gentiles, these who were um, considered outside of the favor of God, although it had always been in Scripture that, uh, and was prophesied that, that God's plan of salvation would also include the Jews. 
The Jews were his chosen people by his divine election. He chose Abraham and from Abraham brought a nation, <clears throat> the Jewish people, and God uh, sealed that covenant relationship with Abraham as we've seen as we've been going through Genesis on Sunday mornings. He sealed that covenant through the uh, exercise of, of circumcision. And that was only a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But we remember in that um, covenant, God had also uh, instructed that all of Abram's household also be circumcised. And that would have certainly included those who were of Egyptian descent, ascent, descent uh, those who were not of the family of Abraham. Uh, it included Ishmael, who would later become the father of, of uh, Muslim nations. Um, and so God's provision and God's plan for this covenant of salvation has always included the Gentiles as well. But it was not fully made known or fully recognized until uh, the, the coming together of the body of Christ, the church, baptized by one spirit, uh, where the wall of division has been torn down by Christ, so that in Christ, as Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, etc., but we're all one in the body of Christ. And so in chapter 3, he begins to talk about that mystery. And uh, in the first six verses, he he just unfolds to us that that once this mystery had not been revealed, but now it has been revealed, and of this mystery, and he clearly states what that mystery is um, in verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So it's, it's not a mystery in the sense that we have to figure it out. Paul clearly states here what he's speaking of, this mystery. Um, the mystery is, is that the Gentiles are now included in the family. They're joint heirs with the Jewish people. So that, that now that there's, there's, there's one body and we're brought together in one body. And can I extend this a little bit further? Regardless of what uh, one's race is, regardless of what one's ethnicity is, the gospel is for all. And in the body of Christ, there, there really should not be a black church, a white church, an Asian church, a Hispanic church, maybe because of language barrier. But in Christ, we are all one so that, so that we are now one race, the body of Christ. And the one who has been born again by the Spirit of God understands that, that there's to be no division. And so in application of this, as we are members of the body of Christ, we are called to extend God's grace to everyone, every person, and there should be no division or no segregation in the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, we should all strive for that um, and encourage that and be a part of that. And so that's one of the things I'm so thankful for here at First Conyers. Um, that there's not a mindset that we are isolated in one ethnicity or one race, but, but we recognize that in Christ we are all one. And man, that, that is a great witness to the community at large when we demonstrate that as a local church, that, um, that, that we are a church of all peoples, and uh, all those people collectively become the body of Christ. And then in verse 7, he begins to talk about this gospel that he was made a minister of, a caretaker of the gospel. And we've talked a lot about what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, that though we were born sinners separated from God because of our sin, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, God, very God, to earth to live a life and to fulfill all the requirements of the law, Jesus never had a single thought of sin. And so that he might be an acceptable sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God against the sin of mankind, that our sins were laid upon him when he went on to the cross, that he was killed, he shed his blood 
for the forgiveness of our sins, that he rose again on the third day. And if we place our trust in him, our faith in what he has done for us, then we will be saved. That's the gospel. Anything more is not the gospel. Anything less is not the gospel. And so Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the grace of God or according to the gift of God's grace. Paul considers himself as a minister of the gospel, that he's been called by the grace of God. And all of us are ministers, ambassadors of the gospel. It's only by God's grace that we've been called to be that. And so he recognizes, particularly in his special calling as an apostle, that it's only by God's grace. I recognize as a pastor, it's only by God's grace that I've been appointed to that role. Um, there's nothing in any of us that warrants us being a minister of the gospel. It's only by his grace. He says, which was given to me by the working of his power, verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me. And what's that grace? To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul, this isn't a false humility here. Paul recognized, realized that Man, he was the worst of all the saints. And if you remember in Paul's life before he had the personal revelation of Christ on the road to Damascus, Paul literally sought to persecute and to murder those who were Christ followers, Christians. He was probably the one standing there at the, that held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament. And Paul was zealous for the law, and that he would go and persecute believers. Now, by God's grace, he has been saved. So Paul recognized, listen, it's only by grace that I've been called to be a minister of the gospel, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Chew on that for a minute. We could share a lot of the riches, I could this morning with us, of, of what we know that the Bible reveals to us, the riches that we have in Christ. But can I tell you that, that those riches are in unsearchable, as Paul says here. We could search them all of our life and never exhaust the unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus. What we have received as joint heirs in Christ in our salvation and beyond, they're unsearchable. And so he again reiterates the fact that it's God's grace that called him to be a minister of that. Would we recognize today that it's by God's grace that, that we can be a minister of the gospel to share with others the gospel, the unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus? God's given us favor to be able to share that. Ask God for opportunities today to share the unsearchable riches of our salvation and grace in Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. He was talking about the mystery again. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. A part of that mystery as well was the church. And we are a part of the church, the body of Christ. And yes, universally, we're part of the church. We're, we're part of the church, the same church that's in Africa, the same church that's in India and Southeast Asia, the same church that's in Europe, the same church that's all over the world. That is the church universal. However, in God's plan, he has so ordained that there would be the local church, that local gathering of believers who are to not only um, encourage one another, edify one another, minister to one another, but primarily it's through that local church that God has planned and makes a plan to propagate, to share the good news of Christ, the gospel. And so I'm thankful for a local church. I'm thankful to be a part of a local church. I always tell people that wherever I pastor, I, I, wanna, I, it, I don't want to pastor a church that I can't first consider myself a member of that church. And it just so happens we were members of this church before the Lord called me to be the shepherd, to pastor this church or the under-shepherd, if you will, of this church. But I'm thankful to be a member, to be a part, an active part, supporting part 
of a local church. If you're not a part of a local church, my encouragement, my exhortation to you would be to get in a local church. And you might say, well, you know, there are a lot of problems in the local church. Of course there are problems in the local church because there are sinners like you and like me that are a part of the local church. <laughs> there are going to be problems. But God has not given that as an excuse for us not to be a committed, active member of a local church, to serve the community all with the vision, all with the mission of displaying God's grace to all people with the responsibility to win those to Christ, to disciple those who are in Christ, and to send them to make other disciples. That's what the local church is all about. There really should be no other vision or no other mission for any local church other than that last command that Jesus gave to us in Matthew chapter 28, to win, disciple, and send. So, as we're a part of that, verse 11, he said, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's always been God's eternal plan, the church, but through the ages, it was, un it was revealed and finally unfolded on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to the church, the body of Christ, in whom, in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Now, that which Paul talks about here is Paul was, a, was under house arrest, in prison, if you will, at the time he wrote the letter to that church in Ephesus. And so he's encouraging them not to lose heart over what he's suffering, because what he is suffering is really for them. Uh, sometimes we need to get a broader-than-us perspective especially when it comes to suffering. Um, it's not always uh, just about us, but it's always about others as well. God is working through our lives, not only to affect us to grow in Christ, but in our lives with him, we also have an impact and an effect on others as well. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you today that uh, God would give you opportunity to share the gospel with somebody to plant a seed, cultivate the seed, or by God's grace, be able to watch him save somebody. I want to put a bug in your ears, an announcement. Uh, this Wednesday night is our corporate prayer, our coming together. It's our first and foremost. I encourage you, although we're shut down with other activities during the summer on Wednesday nights, mark this on your calendar. It is so vitally important for the local church to seek God, to pray. And I want to encourage you to be a part of that physically this week here at the church at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night. And then also mark your calendars. June 20th, which is actually Father's Day, we are having a family gathering, the family of the body here. Uh, we'll be providing hamburgers and hot dogs. We're encouraging you to bring a side dish. We're going to have just a picnic dinner on the grounds on that Sunday beginning at 5 p.m. Then at 6.30 p.m. we have a bluegrass concert inside the sanctuary, that bluegrass gospel concert that I know you'll enjoy being a part of. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. Have a great day. See you tomorrow morning.